Timothy Morton is here tonight in his final lecture of SciArc's second liberal arts masterclass this year, uh, which is part of, an, uh, part of an ongoing effort to both feed and maybe disrupt our, our architectural education with moments of shocking beauty and intelligence found outside the discipline. Engaging these moments, to be clear, is not intended as moving towards interdisciplinarity, which too often reveals a secret wish for generalizing unity, but rather a desire for what I'd call entanglement. In the form of moments of acknowledgement, slight disruptions, and limited engagement of different disciplines all of which have the potential to upend the way we think about architecture without diminishing our expertise. Uh, we, know, we, know Tim from, we know Tim from his incisive but lyrical books, The Ecological Thought, Ecology Without Nature, Hyperobjects, Philosophy and Ecology After the End of the World, also Dark Ecology for a Logic of Future Coexistence and Nothing, Three Inquiries in Buddhism and Critical Theory, which are both forthcoming. He is the Rita Shea Guffey Chair in English at Rice University. And our students and faculty now know Tim after five days as an amazing open thinker who can find deep resonances between King Lear, polar bears, spoons, global warming, Black Sabbath, and contemporary neoliberalism with an agility and curiosity that frankly just makes you smile. But this list of accomplishments and abilities does not capture the Tim that is here right now with us, or the Tim that is an ecology of things non-Tim, which brings me to parts. Thinking about parts is hard. When you live in a world featuring human beings who all too often think they are monolithic or think they are a monolithic audience with a special capability of magically detecting global patterns and connections between all things around them. That is why human reason is an inadequate machine at this point from which to spy on reality. In architecture, we too often subjugate the part in favor of the whole. We like to call it part to whole, which is a statement that in itself subjugates and points towards wholes, as if there is no other end game. <laughs> But despite that, architecture does have a long and varied history of wandering through different ontological models. What exists? How do groups of things exist? What's a city? What's an assembly? In 1966, Robert Venturi spoke about the difficult whole, which is maybe a signal across time to Tim, who speaks about the whole being less than the sum of its parts. A much earlier player, Alberti, in the 15th century said, if the city is like some large house, and the house in turn like some small city, cannot the varied parts of the house be considered miniature buildings? On the one hand, this implies a not so good isomorphism of things and their constituent parts. But on the other hand, it's also a kind of creepy, uh, well, it is also kind of creepy, <laughs> and maybe another thread towards, uh, a thread forward towards Tim's haunted houses. A big house containing and haunted by miniature houses to infinity. Like the cornucopia, which Tim and I were just discussing the other day, because it is a container, which implies something is contained, but at the same time, its contents refuse subjugation by their container. Where is the cornucopia? Is it the horn thing? Or is it the horn thing amongst all the squash and corn and pumpkins and pumpkin things? Impossible scales. Tim brought up the architectural scale the other day also. Um, it is the size of a human foot, so goes the lore, usually the foot of royalty, although I have to say the queen must have very big feet, especially consider that the foot was invented when the mean height of an English person was five foot one inch. The architect's scale is a form of violence because it is used to force everything in the world to relate to the human scale. Only things that are human scale and of our self-limited social space become present to us. Other things are out of our range. Maybe Tim invented the hyperobject to kill the architect's scale. The hyperobject is never fully visible to humans. We are always inside of them. Try to measure that. OK, I move forward. Probably full of stars. Definitely full of awesome. 
<laughs> Number three, nature, status please. For Tim, the human idea of nature is a conundrum and the source of violence we do to ecology. When you accept that nature doesn't exist, that it is so much so socially constructed vapor, then suddenly you can think of the destabilized, denatured, open idea of what surrounds us and what we are embedded in. Zizek said about Tim's work that scientific reification is just an alienating effect of being embedded in this life world. So what is the ontological status of nature? It's a psychological effect of humans, not a real thing. When we eat an all-natural granola bar, we know deep down that there are things like soy protein isolate, likely made by aliens, or at least the military-industrial complex. We see how Google remakes nature into diamonds, and why not? According to Tim, nature was, ever, was never all natural. It is permeated by non-humans. Ecology, not nature, allows us to live and think in an expanded, expanded inclusive social realm that includes all things at all scales. And I would like to end uh, with a quote that I got from his discussion with Olafur Eliasson back in October. This was actually Olafur quoting Tim, I think. <laughs> Art is like a thought sent to you from the future. To which Eliasson follows with, it is like an unthought thought. So with that, I'd like to welcome Tim Morton to the stage. Thank you very much. That is so nice. Thank you, brother. Wow. Thank you so much. I'm so very, very touched to be here, and I've had the most amazing time, and I can't believe it. And I've met all these incredible people, and I'm so completely overwhelmed by everybody's kindness and, and, and generosity and just awesomeness, talking of awesomeness. And um, so now I'm going to ruin all of that by doing this talk. I'm sorry, deeply sorry. Um, it's called Haunted Houses for some reason. Um, this, is, this is this thing that I have to do. I was told that really cool people don't have to do it, you know, so I feel really uncool doing it. But that's okay. Um, really seriously, this has been like the nicest thing I've ever done in terms of like talking my stupid stuff to people and sharing it, you know. And I didn't realize it was gonna be like that actually. Um, it's very, very meaningful for me what, 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 what happened these last few days. So I'm very grateful to my very nice new friend, host, people who've had me to, to, to go a bit crazy in front of you. Because um, what else can I do? So anyway, this talk is called Haunted Houses. Um, and um, there's no really kind of polite way of like saying what I'm going to do, so I'm just going to do it, okay? And I would have gotten away with it if it hadn't been for those pesky kids. The immortal words of Scooby-Doo, of the Scooby-Doo villain. See, I've already ruined it. It's not the immortal words of Scooby-Doo. I've told you, I was rubbish. You should have booked somebody else, yeah? And I would have gotten away with it if it hadn't been for those pesky kids. Of course, they never sound like that because they're American, yeah? But I can't do American accent because I've lived here for 25... Thank you for laughing. Because I've lived here for 25 years, yeah? And the longer you live in America... Like I, I, I realise that English people haven't got a clue about how to do it, so I just don't do it. The immortal words of the Scooby-Doo villain, who has just deployed all kinds of trickery to get the fortune, or whatever it is, by setting up a haunted house type of a situation in which the robbers in bad ghost disguises chase Shaggy and Scooby until they have evacuated what little remains of their vanishingly small wits. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing at my own jokes. It's all gone wrong, hasn't it? It's all gone very wrong, I'm telling you. I'm into this word vanishingly at the moment. Somehow it makes me smile, yeah? You know, I hope, that Scooby-Doo face. I'm sure you'd be seeing good examples of it, right? Huh? Uh -huh. You know the face, the one where he's wondering what the heck is going on. A face that, given the aforementioned limited mental capacity, he pulls quite frequently. It's a sort of cross-eyed confusion, as if a fly were coming too close to his eyeballs for him to focus properly. I use a JPEG of that face in my theory classes. I've been doing it for almost 20 years, so I guess I think it's really important. At first, it was just a pedagogical tactic for relaxing nervous students. Theory class is intimidating, students are shy, participation is part of your grade, and so on. So I say, the dumber of a question you ask, the higher of a grade you'll get. 
Children are well known for asking the most profound questions because they are the most simplistic. Why are you my dad? <laughs> Do we have to have Wednesday? Why can't I watch Scooby-Doo? I like what my Harvard editor, Lindsay Waters, says in these situations. Dare to be dumb. Some of us theory teachers could remember that a bit more when it comes to writing theory-style prose, no? It might be quite a relief if the questions became more profound and dumb-sounding and less sophisticated and intense-looking. It might be more like what Socrates was getting at by saying that he was just a clown, an aron, which is where we get our word irony, which is like Goldie and Bronzy, only it's made of iron. Scooby-Doo's face isn't outside of... Please laugh. Scooby-Doo's face isn't outside of irony. Irony doesn't have to be a cool kid, Salvador Dali-style moustache twiddling sort of a thing at all. The dare-to-be-dumb technique works a charm. And when I see people starting to get scared and trying to come up with some brilliant thing to say, I flash the picture. Remember the face? I'm not seeing the face. You'll get a higher grade if you cross your eyes. Then I began to think about it a bit more, thanks to that kind of thought about Socrates, and I started to wonder something strange. The thought began to creep up on me that, yes, in fact, this was not just a nice, cute version of theoretical wonderment, setting the bar nice and low for intimidated students. I began to wonder whether this was the actual face of theoretical reflection, not just a dumbed-down version of it, that the comical, very physical confusion of Scooby-Doo was, in fact, the theoretical attitude, the quintessence of it, in fact. I began, in other words, to agree with the philosopher Martin Heidegger. It's not every day that you find yourself agreeing with someone who became a Nazi, but I liked... <laughs> I've, it's all gone wrong, hasn't it? It's all gone so very, very wrong. Oh, dear. It's not every day that you find yourself agreeing with someone who became a Nazi, but I like to think that Heidegger's philosophy totally contradicts his Nazism. In fact, I go so far as to believe that his philosophy only works if it isn't Nazi, and what therefore Heidegger, like many of his continental philosophy predecessors, was in fact a bit spooked by something in his own thought, an explosive implication in the way he liked to tell us what was up with the world. The posh way of saying that Scooby-Doo's face embodies something true about how we think theory which is really a word for some continental philosophy and related stuff that some humanist thought was cool and put on their syllabus at some point, so it already has a bit of a record store vibe about it. The posh way of saying, thank you, the posh way of saying is that, 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 that this is the phenomenologically reduced version. Phenomenologically reduced version. You see, ideas always come bundled with attitudes. They come bundled with ways of having those ideas. You can't have the idea without being in a certain mode. Ideas aren't colourless and flavourless. They have a specific frequency, a specific smell. They have ways of being thought, just like Diet Coke. It has a certain fizz, a certain sound it makes when you pour it that's a bit different from regular Coke. There is a certain way you sip it, and so on. You could probably take the Pepsi challenge by watching two people drinking Coke and Pepsi without the labels and just watching their reactions. You could probably figure out which one was drinking Pepsi and which one was drinking Coke. Maybe this dare-to-be-dumb thing was the whole thing, not just a way to get students to talk. Maybe there wasn't such a thin, bright line between true and false as I had thought. Maybe we are, as Heidegger says, always in the truth. In other words, maybe we're always in some kind of Twittersphere, Facebook posty version of truth, like some kind of fuzzy record store, her idea of his idea of their idea of truth. Stephen Colbert's contribution to world peace comes in really handy here truthiness. That face, it's saying truth is being haunted. Being true means feeling haunted. The confusion and ambiguity of truthiness space is intrinsic to truth, not some irritating grime that needs to be cleaned off. Maybe you never get to the naked, shining, transparent, perfect bit. Maybe truth is always truthy, because it always involves a certain way of being it, just like Coke makes you hold the bottle a certain way. It's like there are truth prototypes. There are proto-truths. All my favorite artists talk in this proto-truth mode. Take Björk. Her song, Hyper Ballad, is a classic example of what I'm trying to talk about here. She shows you the wiring under the board of an emotion, the way a straightforward feeling like I love you is obviously not straightforward at all. So don't write a love song like that. 
Write one that says you're sitting on the top of a cliff. You're dropping bits and pieces off the edge like car parts, bottles and cutlery, all kinds of not you, non-human prosthetic bits that we take to be extensions of our totally integrated, up-to-date, shiny, religious, holistic selves. And then you picture yourself throwing yourself off. And what would that look like to the you who's watching you on the st still on the edge of the cliff as you fell? And when you hit the bottom, would, be, would you be alive or dead? Would you be, look awake or asleep? Would your eyes be closed? or open. Maybe the best version, to me, maybe the best version is what is called the subtle abuse mix of the tune by Beaumont Hannand, which I'm going to play. It's a 12-inch remix, the expanded spectral dance version that has much more in it than it, taking little bits of it and making thousands of copies of them, as if a hole were actually a bag full of eyes that on closer inspection were also bags full of eyes, and so on. Maybe down, 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 forever. And now we can go, can we go into like slightly darker sort of like musical appreciation mode or something? Because I'm just going to like play this and like just not actually say anything. Play. Tech person. Oh, there.
Yeah. Um, God, that's haunting, isn't it? Talking of haunting. Um, I spared you the version where I was going to like to that, or like DJ something, you know, or, 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 or get you to dance or whatever. I had these fantasies in the morning, and it's like probably best if I didn't do that um, for everybody's sake. Um, and you know, people, some on, on my Wikipedia page, which you don't get to correct yourself. <laughs> so I'm going to say it now in front of the camera, being streamed. Um, I did not, in fact, take the word hyperobject from math. Um, I found that out later. I took it from, from her, from Björk, hyperballad, yeah? That was the prototype for that word, yeah? Unlike, it's so evocative of exactly what I'm trying to talk about, actually. Um, gosh, there's so many things to say. Um, oh, look, the first word of the first paragraph afterwards is right. 12-inch remixes are neither copies nor separate things, but spectral bags full of eyes that haunt the seemingly individual house of a song. Maybe that's one thing about house music. Named because at the time of AIDS, that was the place that felt most like home for some people. It's in itself a haunted house that isn't about taking apart the idea of house, brick by brick, or taking apart the idea of song, song part by song part, it's just a place where we can remind ourselves that houses and songs are not restricted to the official seven-inch narrow bandwidth version of reality. And also, you know, the thing that, why do I really like that one? It's, it, of course, it's really amazing house music, right? And it's got this incredible Indian sort of thing that they're doing with the sounds and the thing. But it's the way that they focus on the closed or open part, right? It's a completely ambiguous. They're sort of getting that bit of what she's all about, yeah. Vitamin Björk. Um, it's just a place where we can remind ourselves that houses and songs are not restricted to the official seven-inch narrow bandwidth version of reality. The DJ never weaves the 12 inches into a seamless hole that's bigger than, the, 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 than them. She weaves a whole lot of partial object like eyeball bags into a great big eyeball bag. A string of TARDISes adding up to one TARDIS. You know, like Doctor Who's spaceship and all that. I have to explain because I'm English sometimes and like, maybe you know this. Not one to rule them all, but a pretty awesome space for a night out anyway. And when Björk asks you to remix her song, she said, and you know what, she's also really into the OOO, you know. And when Björk asks you to remix her song, she sends you all the parts, all the sound files, and says, have at it, do anything. Chop me into little pieces and multiply the pieces and rearrange them. Make more out of this than the hole that I made. Show me the wiring under the board of my showing people the wiring under the board. That's what she likes about it. Now, in a normal old Western philosophy, a.k.a. agricultural age religion version 2.0, starting with Aristotle kind of a way, truth is something that comes in just one color, white, obviously, right? It's all black and white. There can be no shades of grey, not even one, let alone 50. It's called the law of non-contradiction. And like a lot of laws, there's no reason for it. It's actually never been formally proved. In fact, if you try to prove it, you get stuck in an infinite regress because you have to rely on it to prove it. And there's a sort of child of this law called the law of the excluded middle, which means that you can't have in-between categories. Which is too bad, really, because meadows and gorillas and humans and clouds and biosphere are just the sort of things that you can't categorize as totally solidly themselves. Meadows are made of all kinds of things, and like birds and grass, that aren't meadows. Life forms are made of all kinds of things that aren't alive. Parts of the biosphere don't just go around being parts of the biosphere. They write poems and have sexual display, and they irritate you when they beg for food, and they make friends with goldfish in a pond outside the Hotel Standard in Los Angeles. How do I know that? Engineering and architectural prototypes surround the final version, and that final version is not the truest one, necessarily. It's the one that meets the needs of the firm who commissioned you, or the body that's giving you the grant money. It's the one that meets the requirements of your ego, which might not be the absolute best one. It is, if you're lucky, if you're able to get out of your own way, like the best artists, the point being that the official black and white you is surrounded by this truthy proto-you, like a haunting halo, a much more expanded 12-inch mega mix of yourself that you pretty much can't see. In neurological language, it's now called the adaptive unconscious. 
And in the philosophical tradition of phenomenology, it's called style. And both of those are saying the same thing, that others can see much more of you than you can of yourself. This is how comedy works, isn't it? You see someone trying to do stuff from the position of who they think they are, and how they do it shows you their total style, of which they are not in charge. Never mention the unconscious in front of people and explain that. This totality is weird, then, because it's a whole that is weirdly less than the sum of its parts. Björk's a genius, because she lets that kind of whole come out, which is different from ego display, which is where you think you can put a this is a Tim Morton sentence barcode on every bit of letter and every bit of phoneme that make up Tim Morton's lecture about haunted houses. Something about language shows you something about how meaning is also haunted. Being authentic doesn't really mean being totally and utterly something that transcends its parts like everything has an internal inside stamp on it. Funnily enough, being an author and being authentic in that sense aren't things that we need to get rid of at all, or feel bad about, or reduce to something else, because that kind of authorship already contains all kinds of other beings, and in general, a spectral haunting otherness. A line of a Björk song doesn't say I love you, but instead shows you all the fuzzy little filigrees of wispy seaweed around and in between and inside the I and the love and the you. There actually isn't this rigid firewall separation between language and reality, or more technically, the real, <clears throat> like some very strict Kantian and Hegelian psy or psy uh, psychoanalytic theory is saying. Boundaries are permeable and worlds are perforated, so you can have new ideas and you can share this world with tigers and tigers can share their world with you up to a certain shade of gray point. Maybe black and white are the extremes don't exist at all. That's what Heidegger is saying when he's claiming <clears throat> that there isn't, in fact, a rigid, thin, truthful separation. And I hope you're starting to see that this is totally fantastic, because it means we have wiggle room. And not only that, we don't have to keep playing this game of taking apart sacred cows if we want to be pro 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 progressive philosophers or whatever. We can let holes be holes. We don't have to kill the author, like Bart said we should do, because the author is already undead, a spectral ghost-like being. We don't have to choose between big fascist work and nice, open, um, ragged, rhizomic text. We don't have to keep trying to find the right ism to express the big picture in the best way that makes us so much cooler than those previous isms. That's sort of why the ecological age we're entering isn't going to be an artistic age of isms at all. Because ism world is the wrong end of the Kantian stick. There's a sort of VIP lounge of consumerism, just like there's a VIP lounge in every, every agricultural age religion where they tell you something more like the truth without the theistic or product-oriented copyright control. Indeed, consumerism is related to religion because the VIP lounge, called bohemianism or romantic or reflexive consumerism, is about putting a spiritual value on experience itself rather than products. But that's a long story. We don't have to choose between incremental little rearrangings of deck chairs on the Titanic of whatever this political and economic system this is, and some massive apocalyptic change of everything. Mentioning the apocalypse is important. That's the point. This way of thinking really is agricultural age religion version 2.0 philosophy edition, which is truth, which is where truth is white, not black. We don't have to choose between life and death with a gun to our head, like hardcore pro-life arguments try to force us to do. We don't have to cling for dear life to the idea that we should cling to things for dear life, AKA our normal belief about belief, the one that Richard Dawkins shares with fundamentalists, and also AKA our normal idea of what the word survive means. Since about 10,000 BC, that concept of survival has very successfully almost totally killed off the planet. To the point where in the name of survival we've started the sixth mass extinction event, which ends up with us going extinct because our world just collapsed, because we were trying to put an ins intel inside label on everything, or rather a this is a human being decision thing, otherwise known as anthropocentrism. We would have gotten away with it if it hadn't been for those pesky life forms. We don't have to agree that the Buddhist idea of no self means that you're just a bunch of atoms. What it really means is that you're open. You are a haunted house. Let's go back to thinking about engineering prototypes and architectural models. The only reason why the final version is thought of as special and different is because of a distorted idea of author, which depends on an idea of possess and the concept of property. 
It's like we democratized agricultural age religion so that now at least some people can be little gods, which means they have to own things, including themselves. There is some ridiculous legal fine print here to get the job done of severing the spectral penumbra of style from that author, just like we've severed our ties with non-humans, both inside our bodies and outside, and inside our psychic bodies, and inside our philosophical and social systems. You know, there's one, of the, one example of the legal fine print um, from England, which is sort of amazing um, version, is the functional definition of, of, of a person is someone who has not had more than five acid trips. In a court of law, you are not responsible for your actions if you have had more than five trips. Is that a hint or like what? Is that like a thing that I'm saying, what am I doing now? What's that all about? Is it autobiographical, ethical, ethical? I don't know. Okay. Um, it's like how in Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials series, the General Ablation Board, aka the Catholic Church, goes around severing the ties between people and their demons. Daemons, diamonds, these little spirits that sit on their shoulders just off to the side. Matt Diamon, yeah. The very concept of soul, thank you, is based on a severing and then a privatizing and then an abstracting of this kind of spectre, just as the concept of the consumer is kind of the soul of little me, the guy who actually never demanded loads of plastic shrink wrapping. See what I mean? Like, it's better in a way than agricultural age tyranny and religion and stuff, but only because it's democratized it. And the net effect is that our version of the agricultural age, because we're still in it, is even more ecologically and psychologically violent. If you have a pulse, this should be incredibly obvious, and it's why we love previous versions of our Neolithic temporality, because it's like what Marx says about Greek art. It's like seeing pictures of you as a child, and there's something in your eyes that you don't see anymore. And what is that, actually? And Marx doesn't say this next bit, which I personally believe is a bug, not a feature of his way of thinking. What this is actually is the stuff we thought we'd left behind, the stuff we call Paleolithic. You know, like how people say medieval, you know, it's like that's a really good thing or a bad thing, but it's not a thing that you can be, yeah? The dream time space, or it's perhaps embarrassingly more like the world of Yoda. Why do we even want to watch Star Wars? which is about a genuinely non-theistic world where there is an ambiguous force that surrounds and penetrates life forms and acts causally on them at a distance. Why would that even occur to someone? And why would we flock in the billions to watch that stuff? Especially because, let's face it, quite a lot of it is kind of lame. <laughs> I think I know why. Because we never actually left the dream time. And this thing we keep telling ourselves with our words and our social space and our philosophy and our Stockholm Syndrome feelings that we're out of that world like Adam and Eve is actually killing us. Actually killing us. And all the life on this planet. And truly, truly, it's time to stop. I'm glad I'm so excited because I'd be stark crying. Just hold off hitting retweet on that, please. Even just once or twice, in one or two corners of your life, would be so awesome for the dolphins and the coral and the person who is actually you, despite you. And it's not even difficult to find that again, because the VIP lounges I've been talking about have been containing it, because it's where the actual energy that powers the system lives, in a distorted way to those not in the lounge. And the lounge is as tiny as possible. And so the energy looks like a mere decorative afterthought. Take art, for instance, or the aesthetic dimension in general. Some people think it's exactly this decorative afterthought, sometimes used as glue to stick the awful broken bits of black and white truth space, aka civilization, back together in a fake way. But that's just so not being said from inside the VIP lounge. You're not supposed to speak from there if you're a scholar, which is exactly why I'm going to be doing it for the rest of my life. Phew. Well, that's got that out of the way. Now let's think a bit more close up about architecture. Buildings might well last longer, perhaps far longer than a single human life, and I'm sure, you know, that would tell them, it's like selling coals to Newcastle, isn't it? Anything that lasts longer than us displays strange qualities that are also intrinsic to what ecological awareness is doing to us. Ecological awareness is saturated with nothingness, a shimmering or flickering, a shadow play of presence and absence intertwined. What does this feel like from moment to moment? Stop the tape of the building's history at any point and you will find it is haunted by a weird spectral double. Modifications and fixes, 
plans, prototypes, varying accommodations of internal and external forces. A house is never absolutely present in such a way that you could point exactly to what it is once and for all. This, the house is doubled by its ex-house, Spectre. X as in the X-Men. As a condition of possibility for existing at all. Every house is a haunted house. Our ecological age requires that we take this spectral shimmer into account in our ethical and political decisions, which include architecture. The house simply couldn't exist without plans, projections into the future, anticipations, hopes, fears, memories, and variations. You walk into your house, you buy your house, you live in your house till you die. Guess what? It's not your house. What the variations to the house are for never exhausts what the house is. Teleology is an attempt to contain the temporal explosion that we see, walk around, smell, inhabit, ignore. Why is it a temporal explosion? Because each being has a different kind of temporality. There is human time, Psyarch time, California time, frog time, house time, solar system time. These times are time zones in a much more hardcore way than the way we use the term time zones to describe the different times of day at different points on Earth. A zone is a sort of aesthetic field, like an electromagnetic field, emitted by an object. And when I say object, I mean anything at all. Poem, house, tree, thought. It's obvious when you hear a piece of music. Your normal seeming sense of clock time might evaporate. Or well, think about how, in a story, you might come across an incredibly detailed description of a house. The description is too detailed. It's getting in the way of the flow of the narrative. This is a rhetorical trope we call ekphrasis. Ekphrasis is literally like bullet time in the Matrix. It suspends our normal sense of time and allows us to study things up close. In a way, this up-closeness brings us out of our anthropocentric bubble, just like a too far away viewpoint can. When you drop your iPhone and pick up, uh, um, when you drop your iPhone and pick up a magnifying glass and get really, really close to a surface, you find all kinds of things that have nothing to do with what you want to do with that surface. Say it's the surface of a wall. All you want to do is pan an extension or paint the wall. When you get really close to the surface, you observe, observe all kinds of things in the wall that are irrelevant to that project. The wall isn't exhausted by your human being projects and requirements. Every, every house <clears throat> is a haunted house. And it's haunted by all kinds of things that aren't it. But it gets even weirder. Buildings haunt themselves. And this tells us something very important about objects in general. They're all haunted houses. Why is that? Because what we've been arguing is that to be a thing at all is to be different from how you appear, even to yourself. Different in a radical, structural, irreducible way. That's what we've been saying in various different ways. It's like what happens in film noir. The ultimate plot of a noir film would be one where the detective ends up chasing himself. You know, like in that Seal song, you know, sort of dating me here. But we're never going to survive. You know, that one, yeah? Um, film noir. Um, the ultimate plot of a noir film will be one where the detective ends up chasing himself, not just someone like the himself he doesn't know yet, like how Deckard finds out that he's a replicant in the movie Blade Runner. But this chasing of yourself is exactly what happens in any first-person narrative, because the I that's doing the narrating is structurally different from the I that's the topic of the narration. There is this weird gap, this edge, and this chasing of yourself is something that consumerism relies on. Where do you want to go today, Microsoft ad from the 1990s? You define yourself by your products. I'm a Mac person. You are what you eat. She is an acid head. Toys are us. I hate to break it to you, but consumerism has some serious ecological chemicals in it, and this is one of them. Being totally anti-consumerism as a mode of environmentalism might be throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I'm sorry. I have this thing where I end up becoming the devil in everything I do. Like I have to say the thing that nobody else says, and it's all wrong. It's about the VIP lounge I was talking about. And luckily, thanks to the inner dynamics of consumerism, we're all pretty much in there right now. Right now, we are all experienced junkies, just like Wordsworth and De Quincey and Baudelaire back in the day. We are all about style, not fashion. Surfing, not buying a specific thing. Window shopping, browsing, scrolling through our timelines. As we style ourselves according to our products and our thingies, something else is happening. We are being styled by them. 
Of course, this is what we are told is scary about consumerism. Coca-Cola is controlling your head and so on. But when you think about it, this is a narrow, distorted version of relating to a non-human being without discriminating as to whether it's alive or dead, sentient or non-sentient, conscious or non-conscious. It's funny because I wrote this book, Dark Ecology, and I did the index. And like, I suddenly realized there's loads of references to Coca-Cola in it. So every example is a Coke bottle. So oh my god, it's like product placement. So get some money for it's like a huge Coke ad. <laughs> you know? Put that in your critique pipe and smoke it. Hegelian Marxists watching this. I'm owning it. Blah, 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 conscious or unconscious. And even more than that, it's about allowing that thing to relate to us. Coca-Cola controlling your head is only horrible if you think that you're the only kind of being that has a head to control. We have this disastrous fear of passivity. What if passivity were not the opposite of activity, like black versus white, but a way of thinking about the haunted house version of activity, the 12-inch remix of acting? Wouldn't this be nice, because then we wouldn't we be freed from having to debate endlessly whether a chimp can act rather than simply behave before we allow ourselves to allow it out of the prison that, that is called a zoo. It's not that we are both machines, it's that we are both spectres. Reductionism wants to get rid of the whole thing. But this is really just an upside-down version way of retweeting <clears throat> agricultural age religion. Reductionism wants to eliminate the possibility of finding anything outside the narrow bandwidth. It's not surprising that Agricultural Society 9.0 has spawned the most violent version yet called eliminative materialism. Eliminative materialism. What really needs to happen is that we need to get to a place that when we hear the word materialism, we don't hear the words reduce or eliminate. We need a Björk remix of materialism. We may be anthropomorphizing everything, and we may not be able to help it, even when we consciously mean not to, because after all, we are humans, and our human hands grip Coke bottles in a certain way. But luckily, the bottle is also bottle-morphizing our hand. And even more than that, this may have nothing to do with our personal way of styling ourselves at all. It is in excess of that. There's only one big problem. The problem is that the amount of non-human styling of ourselves that we are letting in. As we let more and more in, we exit normal consumer space. It's as simple as that, or at least as simple sounding as that, which is a pretty good start. This is the flip side of the Kantian idea that rules our world, that we are in a kind of loop with the data or appearances or whatever of things to us. The flip side speaks to the fact that this is happening at the t same time as the actual thing in itself is withdrawn from our direct perception or cognition or use or anything. There must be pleasure modes that can't be co-opted, but we have to get to them by embracing the world we are in now, rather than trying to fix Agricultural Society 9.0 via Agricultural Society 3.0 or whatever. Unfortunately, all that stuff about need versus desire, which also affects things like Marx's theory, is about that kind of fix. We have to drop the illusion of some unsullied, straight-up need that got twisted into desire. We have to go all the way through desire, I think these excessive pleasure modes will definitely be found in the regions and edges where humans and non-humans touch in all sorts of ways, social, psychic, philosophical, physical. This is because consumerism is anthropocentrically scaled, and so when you really get up close to a thing, it stops being anthropocentrically functional and thus ceases to be functional for consumerism, which is agricultural religion 9.0, or what have you. And I'm not going to let you get away with thinking that consumerism somehow already co-opted my argument because we have already allowed ourselves to be taken apart by consumerism, dissolved into all kinds of schizophrenic multi-channel entities as if the problem was being together and sane. It's not that, because the way you're looking at it in that case is from some impossible safe position outside of consumerism, looking down on it and judging it, and that's exactly what you can't do. Not because it's everywhere, but because of its inner logic. Which is loop, which it's, in which its loop-like form doesn't allow you to achieve escape velocity from it. This is what happens to Robert Arctor in Philip K. Dick's novel, A Scanner Darkly. He thinks he's watching himself, rubbernecking his own dissociation via the drug Substance D, derived from little blue flowers, talking of agricultural stuff. But of course this idea of watching yourself from afar is exactly an effect of the drug. So cynical reason is doing exactly what consumerism wants. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, Hegelian Marxists. 
the precise way that consumerism keeps on co-opting things is the kind of force that will help us to unwind it, exclamation mark. The endless game of trying not to sell out is not the pathway, but this is not because there is no authentic stuff, despite consumerism, it's because our definition of authentic needs a haunted house upgrade. So we need to include non-humans in our architectural designs, not because it's nice or because we need to condescend to things and make them ersatz humans with rights, not for any reason involving good or evil at all, because that's an artifact of agricultural age religion. We need to include non-humans because it's fascinating, because we can't help it, because we know too much. We're not trying to be kind. It's that this is our kindness in the sense that this is how we are, we want to be maximum chameleons. We want, to own our use of our, we want our own use of our own house to be affected by frogs, uh, uh, to be affected by how frogs and lizards and dust use it. It already is, you know. There are all kinds of filters and air conditioners and mildew-resistant paint to eliminate non-humans. You just have to imagine an upside-down version of that. Not that you're going to make a house that's going to kill people, but because then the people wouldn't be around to relate to the environment. We're talking about going beyond tolerance to actual appreciation, appreciation for no reason. For some reason, this part of your house is where sparrows, not you, get to have fun. But you get to have fun by appreciating the sparrow fun. Being, being a rock or a lizard, not just being a human, means being a chameleon who picks up impressions of every surface she touches. That's the definition of genius that Keats likes. It's why he says Shakespeare is brilliant, because he can allow himself to be taken over by so many types of people. Kindness means being kind of sorta, because you are permeated with other beings, physically and experientially and everything else. When people use that word to discriminate, they don't like your kind, for example, they are restricting it to the narrow bandwidthness that we have been exploring, the one that associates the word kind with the word nature, thus eliminating the shades of grey qualities of kind. We sort of need both, at which point nature stops being nature underneath appearances, and appearances stop being superficial candy on top of nature. As we open up the bandwidth of our experiences of thing data, we will inevitably reach a point that can't be co-opted or turned into a product at all. In my view, to be a thing is to be finite, and this must also apply to capitalism. We can get past this finitude with a sort of 12-inch remix of consumerism, which is equivalent to allowing ourselves to be haunted by things. This is what achieving solidarity with non-human beings really looks like. It's like Scooby-Doo figures out that he is also a spectre in a haunted house of illusions and spectres. He's not there to demystify the ghost anymore because this kind of ghost isn't on a mission to steal money or make people unhappy. This kind of ghost is just how things are. When you stop retweeting that agricultural age religion that's gumming up our ways of imagining a different future, we should pray to be haunted. We should pray to be Scooby-Doo. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm so, so happy to take, to, to, to take questions, obviously. Thanks for coming, by the way. You know? Yeah. Hi, Tim. Thank you for the Hi. lecture and the past couple of days of talks oh, here. My pleasure. Thank you for being there. Um, I'd like to ask a question about what you just mentioned about the non-human scale uh, within the buildings and mm -hmm. the idea of accommodating other things, not to neg negatively impact the human, but just to make it more interesting, or we know too much, so we bring in something that we don't know. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit more about the idea of interacting with things that are non-human on purpose with humans? Right on, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so when I said that we know too much, that's not a bad thing. I'm actually saying that's a good thing, right? It's like we, you can't unknow what you know. Like, and once you reach a certain like, knowledge threshold, you can't think certain things that you used to think, right? So it's not about like, trying to think less. When I say you, we, know, we know too much, it doesn't mean that's bad, it's like that's good. I'm into the too much side of things, you know, right? 
George Harrison song, About to be sung, Stop it, Tim, keep it down. <laughs> um, so like, um, okay, so here's the thing, you see. I, I, I like to set the bar super low for the psychology stuff, you know, because we all sort of tell ourselves that it's this really special, amazing thing, right? And not you, but like, the way that you might hear the question could be it is a, as a kind of churchy question, like how can we become good people instead of sinners? Do you see what I'm saying, right? And then I'm supposed to say, well, it's very difficult and impossible, actually, but if you sort of try, you might get sort of saved in some way. Pray, you know, pray in that sense, you know. Like, like um, talk to the guy with the bat phone to God or God. You know, either, either will do, the monarch or God, either. Uh, so it's not that, right? So like, I, instead, I like to say, always already you are relating to non-human beings. I mean, you know, you have bleach. Yeah, you have bleach, you kill bacteria. Right, that's, a, that's relating to non-human beings. You know, it's, it's relating them in, in a sort of killing sort of a way. You know, and maybe there could be like a bit less of that. You know, so like actually, you know, vinegar's nice, right? It's, it's less horrid in, 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 in lots of ways. Um, and then you don't like force all the bacteria to upgrade and create like bad feedback loops and stuff. So one thing you're trying to do is like, like cool down the positive feedback loops. You know, like how like thermostats like operate with a negative feedback loop, cooling down the, the positive feedback loop, and that's how sort of like one concept of Gaia works, right? Which is that Gaia is like a thermostat that like cools down the, 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 the feedback loops or something like that, yeah? Not that I'm trying to persuade you about that. It's actually an idea I don't really believe in, yeah? For slightly technical reasons. Um, the clue is in the name. It's an agricultural age goddess. You know, even the goddess stuff is agricultural age, as Rigore reminds us, right? That's not far back enough. You've got to go fully into spirit world, spirit animal world, if you want to, like, go to the future, you know? Um, so that's sort of part of it, right? In, in, including non-human beings would, be, would mean creating more negative feedback loops, situations. <clears throat> but it would also mean, you know, relating to the ambiguity and strangeness of things without deleting them, you know, too quickly. Um, whatever that means to you, I'm not the architecture dictator, I'm not going to say like, put a little frosted window over there in the corner and the bar where it's not supposed to be where the plug socket is, and I, I, I like really freak people out, you know. <laughs> like, is the point, as I was talking earlier today um, with the magnificent David Rui, like, is, is that the point actually to like freak people out? Are we actually trying to freak, is, is that the point? Does weird mean being totally different than, right, or does weird mean a little bit uncanny, right? Uncanny means being Weirdly the same as, actually, right? Uncanny, uncanny's better, yeah? Familiarly strange and strangely familiar, that's uncanny, yeah? And uncanny, like, the feeling of uncanniness derives from the fact that we've been born, actually, argues Freud, you know? And in a way, it's only uncanny because of patriarchy, right? It's only uncanny because we're so freaked out by having come out of a vagina. You know, it's so untrue that we came out of ourselves. You know, this sort of Levi-Strauss idea that we're always computing in mythology the idea that we either came from ourselves or we came from other people. No, 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 no. We all bloody well know at the back of our heads that we came from something else, right? And this we came from ourselves thing is a way of sort of like half deleting that idea by making just making it one of a two possibilities, you know? We really so did come from other stuff, like lizards and bacteria and stuff. Do you know what I'm saying? That's evolution theory. It's so obvious, yeah? It's so obvious that academics don't like to talk about it. They want it to be all clever and stuff. And so, like, um, ecological awareness, you already have it, right? Because, like, I'm going to go even lower down than, like, like, I was being interviewed by this guy, and he was like, why should I care? And I'm like, well, do you have a cat? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, do you stroke your cat? And he's like, yeah. I said, well, you already care for a non-human being for no reason at all. That is ecological awareness, right? And then I thought, well, maybe clothes, right? Do you wear clothes? Are you wearing clothes now? I think you are. Um, they're non-human beings. You're relating to them for no reason, especially if you're into style, not fashion, right? So that's really super low. But let's go even cheaper. Do you ever use bleach? Do you wash your hands? You know, do you vomit? You know, it's, it's, it's incredibly easy. That's the problem. It's actually much too easy. So you kind of like jump over it. You're trying to find something really clever and sophisticated because the intellectual game recently has been the more kind of clever and sophisticated and jumpy over I can be, the more smart I am than you. 
right? But actually, what if the direction of smart wasn't that way, but like that way? Like, what if the direction of irony wasn't like feeling like you were winning, but actually feeling like you were losing, you know? Which is kind of more irony, in a way. It's like the smile you get when you realize that like, your very attempt to avoid the car crash has created the car crash. You know, that kind of one. You know, maybe that's a bit of an extreme example, yeah? Maybe you don't really smile in that situation. You know. <laughs> Delete that bit. <laughs> Cut that bit out, yeah? When we, when we do the final one. But something like that, yeah? Um, so, you know, it's going to involve that, and it's, it's going to involve irony, right? And it's going to involve the sort of cheap, cheap-ass stuff, you know? S really, really obvious, readily available stuff, because guess what? We're already surrounded and permeated by non-human beings. Otherwise, we wouldn't exist. We just keep telling ourselves that we're not, and this telling of ourselves that we're not has been going on for 12 and a half thousand years, and it's incredibly traumatizing. And the trouble is that telling ourselves that we're not has also involved a bunch of like practices, like, you know, killing things and patriarchy and the 1% and stuff, right? And excluding other beings from our social space and stuff, even though they're in it. You know, it's literally like severing something inside your body and it's still inside your body. You know, so this is like a deep, 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 deep psychic philosophical social wound that we're talking about here, you know? And so like, maybe there's different kinds of like moments at which this relating to non-humans happens. Like maybe it's like, not like, pray and then you become good instead of evil. Maybe it's more like, first of all, you need to go through a grief process. Maybe first of all, you need to design stuff that's like helping people to be outside of shock, right? Because that's kind of what we're in right now with the ecological stuff, we're in shock mode, right? Either we're in denial or we're like, it is happening, damn it, can't you see? Like, you know, like the wrong way to talk to somebody whose friend just died. Slap, 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 you know? That's the, that's the problem with global warming information delivery mode. It's the most horrifying data dump mode that any sane person should hate. You know, I, I don't want to see another 350.org anything. You know, in my inbox or on a beach, photograph from a satellite, you know, it's like, how many times has that kind of propaganda actually worked? Because they keep having to do it, right? But beyond and above that, every day when you turn on the news, you hear something, you know, subtract all the content, you hear something like, Two, 5.7, 100,000, 4 billion, 20%. Ah, how many more numbers am I going to have to hear? And then the next day, there's a whole bunch of other numbers. Do you know what that's like? That's like PTSD dreaming. Yeah, well, when you have PTSD, you have these recurring nightmares, right? And in the recurring nightmare, you're restaging the trauma. And what are you doing? Because there must be some pleasure there, Freud asks, asks himself. What is that? Because you're doing it lots and lots of times. There must be some way that something's getting off on something. Right? What's that? Right? What it is, you're trying to install yourself fictionally before the trauma happened, and then you can see the trauma coming, and then you can anticipate it, and then it's not so traumatic. Well, that's what you can't do with trauma, because trauma is exactly the thing that you can't anticipate. So the way we're delivering ourselves the ecological information is preventing ourselves from being ecological. Because being ecological means recognizing trauma space. You are in trauma space. Right? So how you talk to somebody like whose wife just died suddenly isn't that. You know, you kind of gently and like maybe you help them to smile. You know, like I remember when my best friend from school committed suicide about 14 years ago, yeah. And I was completely weirded out. And when somebody does something like that, you can't even feel access the upset. That's the trouble with that kind of trauma, right? And I happened to be in a setting where somebody who does trauma work was there, right? And she said something that made me feel a bit perverse, like you, you, this part of you is enjoying the fact that he killed himself. And it was so upside down and perverse and it was kind of horribly true, you know? And it made me kind of laugh and then from laughing I could cry, right? That's what we need really with ecological information. We need to get people to the crying place, right? And like sometimes like helping people to smile, then you can cry for real. Do you see what I'm saying? Instead of this horror mode that we're in, like, don't you see, don't you want... That's actually preventing us from feeling hor 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 horror, in a way, and, and uh, an appropriate level of sadness for what's going on. It's like too much. It's like we're juicing ourselves with another kind of trauma, which is the information delivery mode, to prevent ourselves from the first one. And it's like we're giving ourselves multiple, multiple traumas upon traumas, and then we're getting, like, Stockholm Syndrome about it, right? And so this is, this is what I'm going to encourage you to do. Right? Like, work with that 
for now. Like maybe a hundred years from now, it's going to be different. But right now, I think like working with that fact is, would, 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 would be a good thing in design. And again, I can't tell you exactly what to do with that. You know, I know what I'd like because I've got my own tastes. You know, it would look a bit like J.F. Sebastian's workshop in, in, in Blade Runner, but that's just me. Yeah. So then maybe like a Mike, Mike. Like Sorry, can you wait? There's a mic. Mic. So then there could be like a smiling entry point of the, the empathy of building for the birds, the joy of the birds, the pausing and smiling with there the birds. There you go. Yes. Then you can smile with joy. Once you can, you, you can like cry, yeah, then you can go to the joy place, right? Ecological awareness is a, is a kind of descent into joy through various other things, right? And it's a little bit like going inside a chocolate, right? Um, the outer layer is guilt. Usually we get kind of stuck there. It's like the sugar coating of the chocolate, right? And we all know it's a bit wrong. Guilt is crystallized enjoyment. It doesn't really work. It's like addiction stuff, right? Then underneath that is a layer of called shame. That's the chocolate, right? Shame, people often say, oh, that's a great emotion. We should feel ashamed. You know, do, I don't want to feel ashamed one more second of my life. It's like, when I feel ashamed, I want to kill myself or kill the person who's shaming me. That's a bit wrong. Let's not do that. But it's a slightly slowed down version of this guilt thing. So, okay, and, and, and it's why you can have guilt, because you can have shame. But you can have shame because you have disgust. Now we're getting a little bit closer, because disgust is like, oh my God, I've got all this stuff stuck to me. Get it off me, you know? The trouble is, if you get stuck there, it's called fascism. That's what fascism is. It's like thinking that the disgust thing is a thing that you can peel off of yourself and eliminate, right? So you have to go further in. So we can have disgust because we have horror. Horror is when you realize you can't actually peel the disgust thing off. And a lot of philosophy is stuck there right now, right? And it's in that horror mode. You know, the PTSD delivery information mode of global warming is also the kind of speculative realist information delivery mode. You know, we're just tiny, insignificant, meaningless things, and probably we should just go extinct. You know, it's, a, it's, it's like a really boy thing, you know? And like, when you analyze it, the attitude that's holding that idea is literally Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> ah, like Home Alone face. Ah, right. Once you figure that out, it's funny, right? It's, it's funny, right? Once you figure that out, it's not horrible, it's funny. That's the next level. It's called the ridiculous, right? It's where like Samuel Beckett plays live. Yeah, it's not horrible anymore, but it's not nice, but it's ridiculous. Now we've entered dark ecology space. Now we've entered actual, like for real, ecological awareness as far as I'm concerned. We've also entered an interesting region called the realm of toys, which I'm not going to talk about. Anyway, you can have this ridiculousness because you can have depression, otherwise known as melancholia. Right? This is so fucked, and I can never get out of it. I'm just going to like sit here with all the other toys in J.F. Sebastian's shop, because I'm a toy in J.F. Sebastian's shop. I don't care anymore. I'm just a puppet. I'm like the astro I'm like um, Buzz Lightyear. He sort of gives up after a while. Do you know what I'm saying? He sort of sits around a tea table having tea. With the, with the dolls, you know, because he realizes he's a puppet. That's a really, that, that's like deeper ecological awareness world, where you're like, I don't care if I'm a robot, I don't care if you're a specter, I don't care, <laughs> you know. The guardian of that world is Wally, you know, Wally. He, he, he kind of collects stuff without knowing why, you know, he just sort of melancholically assembles collections of stuff, and the music they listen to is like Cocteau Twins. It's like got this kind of ethereal, gothy, shoegazy, I love that bit. I love that layer of ecological awareness. I sort of want to stay there. Quite a lot of the music in the standard at the bre in the breakfast room is this sort of soft, s sort of silvery, surfy, psy contemporary, psychedelically shoegazy stuff with like nice beats. Do you know what I'm saying? But like really natural sound. It's brilliant. Yeah, really quiet. Thank you, California. It's sort of misty, kind of misty, mysterious, misty, salty, misty, multicolored misty. Yeah, and it's sort of like that. Like that that's a good spot to be in. You know, and you know, like, just one layer below that. Why can you have melancholia because you have sadness, right? Why can you have all this wonderful kind of gothy stuff? Because goth is like, the, it's like a great ecological art mode, actually, gothic. Yeah, any kind of goth, right? Like, why can't there be an ecology for like slightly depressed, moody people who don't want to put on a pair of shorts and run up a mountain and yodel? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, why can't there be one for me? Like, people who are like really freaked out and just want to like, listen to weird drum and bass with like the covers over their head. Do you know what I'm saying? Why can't, be, why can't there be an ecology for those people? It would include more people for a kick off. You know? Anyway, um, 
So, like, you can have sad now, now, now sadness is where we hit beauty, right? Beauty is sad, isn't it? Beauty is sad because you can't grasp the beauty object, right? You can't grasp it. You don't know why you love this person. You just love them. You don't know why you like this piece of music. You just like it, yeah? So you can't tell, right? There's this kind of sadness there. You can't hold on to it, but it's real. You're experiencing experientially what we like to call object withdrawal at that point. You're having like, a, like an experience of it. You see what I'm saying? You're, it's, it's getting quite real now, this sadness space, right? Okay. And it's less conditional because it's not exactly like objectified. It's like the, the experience itself is a kind of entity and you don't know who started it. Is it you or is it the Mona Lisa? You know, you can't really tell. If you could tell, then you could like either make, take the bit of the Mona Lisa that you, you think is doing it and photocopy it a million times and that would be a million times more beautiful. It wouldn't be, would it? Imagine. Or you could isolate the brain chemical and like create like a really souped up version of it and let's call it like, I don't know, let's make a random sequence of letters. MDMA, what about that? Let's call it that. And then let's take like a million of those, right? That, that obviously wouldn't be that great either, yeah? So like, you can't decide whether it's coming out of you or out of the thing, right? So suddenly you're beginning to acknowledge that things that aren't you have agency, right? That's the problem with beauty, really. It's not that it's this glue, it's that there's this weird warning that not you stuff is also important. You know what I'm saying? Um, anyway, the reason you can have sadness is because you have longing. That's one level below, right? Longing, you can have longing, yeah. The, 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 the beauty experience is like way, way excessive. It's not like nicely, neatly contained. Everybody's always trying to police it or like wish it away because of this weird, excessive, like perverse longing thing inside it, yeah? You want to be reconnected to the polar bear. Do you know what I'm saying? You do. And like, because you want to be reconnected to yourself, right? Because polar bears are us, literally. Neanderthals are us, bacteria are us, right? Remember? Yeah, toys are us. It also means DNA are us, right? Right? Why can you have longing? Because you have joy. Then now we've hit the joy space, right? Now you can have the joy kind of ravey version of the smile. Right, I'm sorry, that's a really long answer, but like, that's where you locate where, where that smile is, right? And we're not there yet. Someone told me once about this term, amwina, that's, I, I think, in Argentine Spanish, that means, like, that's referring to the pain of cuteness, when something is just, yeah, like, so there you cute, go. and you're like, ah! Like, right. It's so cute, and it's, right. it's, it's like, extending that's great. around you, this cuteness. You cannot that's great. hold great. the bunny. I'm, gr thank you. I'm always on the lookout for the fast track to that sadness level. And that might be it. Like, I want to bypass the horror, thank you very much. I want to get past this patriarchal boy freak out. Like, oh my God, I came out of a vagina. Ah! Like, how many times do you say that like, without sounding like really wrong? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you can only say it once, maybe, you know. Right, and you, you can like, get away with it once. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, if at all. Um, so I'm looking for fast track ways to like bypass that one and go straight from guilt to joy. Boom, let's do it, right? And that could be one, right? So maybe another tactic in your house would be like cute, cute stuff, you know? It's, it's, it's a neglected category. You know, the whole kind of kitschy, cutie thing, because the thing is like the 12-inch remix of beauty is that it, it includes kitsch, right? Kitsch is the disgusting shit that other people like, structurally. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, how come there are so many snow globes of Gandalf? Like, somebody must be buying these, man. Do you know what I'm saying? That side of, 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 of beauty, like the unacceptable wrong bit, you know, the, the, like the spectral bit, right? There's a lot of stuff about kitsch that's actually got some really good ecological chemicals in it, you know? Okay, one more question. Yes, I'm so sorry. These answers um, are also 12-inch remix. Maybe this isn't a great last question, but could you please do an overdub of Home Alone? <laughs> do an overdub of Home Alone. Yeah, like the movie with Macaulay Culkin in it. Mm. I'm seeing... God, I wish I could. I actually <laughs> cannot potential. remember enough of the script. And yeah, Not right now, any... just... Oh, right, right. No, not right now. Oh, yeah. no, thank God for that. <laughs> just for a minute there, I thought I you just were just like, can you Home do Alone... Over... I can do other stuff. I could do like, I don't know what. I could, I don't know what. Sugar Hill Gang, you want to hear that one? So like, no, but like, yeah, okay. I mean, All just, right, the concept, I just like listening to what you're saying and... Sure. The concept of home alone, there's some interesting contradictions. 
I think there's a lot to be got out of like that. That, could that, that tactic. Be fruitful. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. Just but a, like a thought. Sorry. Okay, so no, 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 no. <laughs> and I'm going to make it really important and serious and relate it back to architecture. Just watch. Okay, so like, <laughs> I really am though. Because, like, in a way, because in a way, this is like the sermon part of it. Aren't we all overdubbing the, the stuff? Like, isn't that the 12 inch remix thing that I'm talking about? Right? You're sort of doing an overdub version of the architecture, metaphorically speaking. You're taking something that's already there and you're sort of overdubbing it somehow with like non human stuff, which is already there. But you're just like bringing it up in the mix. Right? Like, those guys bring up certain things in, hyper, in hyperballad. Right? Got it? Good. Thank you. <laughs>